Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining this lecture. This is the third lecture in a row uh, about Serbian saints of a recent time. And uh, t today or tonight, uh, we will uh, give some uh, facts about Saint Basil of Ostrog, a, saint, a Serbian saint from 17th century. Well, it was not uh, fully in a chronological way of presentation. So I first presented two weeks ago about Saint Peter of Cetinje, a Serbian saint from Montenegro, nowadays Montenegro. Then I presented Bishop Nikolai Velimirovic, or uh, Serbian Golden Mouth, or Serbian Zatosti, as we can say who although lived uh, most of his time in uh, Macedonia and later in the United States, is regarded as one of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Serbian saints who are recognized everywhere uh, and very well known. And tonight I'm saying of one even more prominent Serbian saint, uh, the saint who uh, gives so many miracles over the centuries by now. That's Saint Basil of Ostrog. And as you, most of you might have known, and you know now, is that his relics uh, are placed in Ostrog Monastery in the central part of nowadays Montenegro. And many, many people are coming every year almost let's say every day, like it's thousands and thousands, I guess it's even millions per year of visitors, of like faithful people who are coming with prayers to the saint to ask for uh, uh, intercession of Saint Basil and to help uh, in any need. And this is uh, one of most uh, uh, realistic uh, presentation of his uh, outlook on how he was looking uh, in, during his life. And this is an icon, one of the icons representing him in uh, the Ostrog Monastery, and which is a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, model for uh, represent his representations in uh, the other churches all over the Serbian Orthodox Church. There are several more interpretations um, also similar to this one, this resembles to his advanced age, nearly his uh, passing in low repose in Lord. And uh, this is a Troparion, which is unlikely to the other, most of other Serbian saints, which, is, which are given in uh, tone eighth, this one is in tone fourth, more similar to Saint Nicholas, uh, St. Nicholas of uh, Cappadocia and Mirlikia, which we celebrate on December 19th. Which means that uh, uh, from the early time of after his uh, repose, people recognized him, even during his life, people recognized him as a saint, as a miracle worker, wonder worker. And uh, that's why he was yep. compared and put it a similar line as Saint Nicholas of Mirlikia, uh, which I mentioned. And uh, on the right hand side, no, I, I got it. I, it's it's, it's uh, Ostrog okay. Monastery. This is the upper monastery. There are two monasteries. I will say something more about that later, where his relics are laid and uh, where they are now. Just see, okay, have some troubles here. Yeah, uh, there are no, not many facts about his life that we know by now. We know that he was born in, on, on uh, the December 28, uh, 1610, at the beginning of 17th century, in uh, what's nowadays uh, Herzegovina close to Monastery Zavala in the village of uh, Mrkonici. And uh, his parents were Petar Jovanovic and Anastasia, who lived in that area. So uh, 
his uh, baptismal name was uh, Stoyan. He was born as Stoyan Jovanovic. And at a very early age, he showed a deep uh, piousness and devotion to church, the same as his parents were. It's, it was uh, said that they also were very pious people. But uh, for their piety and being devoted uh, to God, they had many troubles from the other villagers. Like at that time, there was some kind of uh, troubles with Turks. Uh, at the beginning of 17th century, there were several wars between uh, the world powers at the time, like Russia and Austria against Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. So uh, in the time of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, lawful and lack of laws and everything like that, uh, there was troubles also between the villagers. So there were some uh, greedy or jealous people who uh, blacklisted his parents. So they had many troubles from Turks. And in order to protect his only child, uh, Stoyan, they sent him to Zavala Monastery where he spent uh, some time there at his uncle, monk Serafim, who was uh, about a deaf monastery, and uh, spent there about two to three years, where he learned to read and write. And afterwards, he moved to Tvrdoš monastery, which was, uh, let's say, a bigger center of monastic life. There were more monks, uh, while at the other side, it's like uh, only few of them in Zavala at his uncle. So he moved there and it was more secure to stay in Tvrdoš closer to the areas of uh, Montenegro. And he spent several years there. He became monk, he received the monastic vows and became deacon and hero monk. And from the early age of his life, he was uh, noticed as a deeply pious and devoted to church, uh, mostly in silence and deep silent prayers. Even though he was posted as a parish priest for several churches in uh, the Popovo Polje, its area around between Trebinje and Zavala, it's like a valley. And he served as parish priest for several churches. Uh, you know, during that time, it was a lack of priests anywhere uh, in the Serbian lands under the Ottoman Turkish rulership. So he served there, but uh, he wanted more, just more uh, a deeper monastic life and prayer life, you know. And so he moved, he tried to see if uh, it would be possible to stay in Montenegro, which was even more protected, uh, less harm, harmed by Turkish forces and by wars. So he went to visit uh, Bishop or Metropolitan Mardarje, Mardarje of Cetinje. At that time, like it, it was about uh, 1630, 1635. But uh, he was not so satisfied by the church life there due to the fact that the uh, Metropolitan Mardarje uh, at that time uh, fell under the influence of uh, union with the Roman Catholics, which uh, uh, made a lot of troubles to the Serbian clergymen and Serbian church all al along uh, the Adriatic coast, the parts of Serbian lands and the Serbian church, which is near the sea from the centers of uh, Venetians, Venetian cities along the Dalmatia coast, which were Roman Catholic parts, you know, at the time. And uh, from there, there were many missionaries sent to the Serbian lands, which already were disturbed and troubled under the Ottoman Empire rulership. And uh, they were often uh, offered like to change if, to accept the union with Roman Catholics in exchange for uh, getting some material benefits like uh, uh, food supplies or some housing and other support and protection, even more protection guaranteed from the state of Venetia. So many people 
were disturbed by that and uh, some of them even accepted the union and uh, subsequently became Roman Catholics in few decades later or like next century, 18th century and so on. It is the fact why there was a spreading of the Roman Catholicism along the coast and uh, behind the coast area like in the Lika, Dalmatia and Herzegovina later in 18th and 19th century. So uh, Vasilyev was very strong and strict in this so that he didn't want to get any kind of compromise with about fate. And so he criticized the metropolitan Mardari and left him and went to Pechka Patriarchia, which means like Patriarchate of Pech. Uh, that was the center of uh, medieval Serbian church and the, the seat of the Patriarch. And later in the 16th century, as some of you might know, uh, uh, Turkish Ottoman uh, uh, prime ministers, which are called as great vizirs. Uh, one of them was uh, of Serbian origin uh, with the last name of Sokolovic. It was Mehmed Pasha Sokolovic who gave uh, freedom to Serbian church uh, and the uh, right to get uh, autocephality, autocephaly. Uh, it was about mid, mid of 16th century, about 100 years before St. Basil. So there was a free Serbian Orthodox Church of uh, Patriarchate of Page, and the Serbian Patriarch was uh, elected among the bishops and metropolitans on the territory of Serbian lands and Serbian church. At the time, it was a very famous uh, patriarch in the Page Patriarchia. It was a uh, Paisie of Janjevo, Paisie Janjevac who also later became a martyr because uh, Turks uh, have murdered him due to his opposing to give some privilege to Turks and uh, for uh, supporting some appraisals of Serbs in some areas. So they accused him and murdered him in uh, 1647. But uh, in uh, 1638, uh, Saint Paisi recognized a young monk, here monk uh, Basil or Vasilie of Ostrog, recognized him as a deeply pious and very capable and uh, with uh, spiritual charism so that he can lead people, his flock, his uh, devoted faithful people in the area where he was born and around. So he elected him a bishop at the Holy Synod of Serbian bishops in uh, 1638 and was consecrated in a uh, Patriarchate of Page in one of the churches there and sent back uh, to Herzegovina. He was elected as a Metropolitan of Zahumje and Herzegovina. Uh, and Diocese of Zahumje is one of the oldest uh, dioceses in Serbian Orthodox Church, which was established by Saint Sava in uh, 1219, when Serbian church got the autocephalus from uh, the Patriarchate of Constantinople. At the time, St. Sava established several uh, primordial uh, dioceses of the Serbian church, of the Serbian uh, archbishopric, as he was archbishop, as you know, not yet patriarch, but he established the uh, new dioceses it was it's called in serbian church terminology in general church terminology is called uh, arrondation it's a legal term so when when uh, one diocese split into two or when two dioceses change their borderlines so then it's called arrondation so it was like arrondation of the previous uh greek or uh, constantinople patriarchate uh, dioceses on that territory so that uh, St. Savar changed it and established some new dioceses like Zahumje and the other, like Stone. It was also Stone Bishopric Diocese uh, at the territory uh, between Neum and uh, uh, Pelješec Peninsula. But this part closer to Trebinje and closer to Boka Kotorska uh, was under the seat of Diocese of Zahumje. And there, St. Basil was sent to be a metropolitan. So he was metropolitan of Zahumje and Herzegovina for many years, more than 30 years, more than 33 decades. 
and he had many, many troubles during that time, as you might have heard. There were uh, uh, several wars, like uh, Candian War from 1645 until 1669. It was most of the time of the life of St. Basil, when there were many uh, like Turkish and Austrian troops uh, getting over those lands and destroying everything on their way. So there was a famine, frequent famine. Many people became poor and uh, needed uh, like uh, the asylum in churches and in church territories and get some support and food and so on. That's why uh, also St. Basil moved from Austrian monastery very early and uh, moved also his uh, bishopric or metropolitan seat from Tverdosh monastery to the monastery of Ostrog. At the time, uh, there was, in, in his time, there was no monastery there. There were just some caves, which were also by the tradition, Christian tradition, were a place where another monks stayed for during their lives. Earth on earth, uh, like uh, Saint Isaiah of uh, Onogost. And Onogost is also part of Montenegro in the ancient medieval time. It's closer to Zeta now, nowadays. And uh, it was said that uh, Saint Isaiah was exactly in the cave where several centuries later Saint Basil came to be first as a monk and later as a bishop. And he started building. Uh, some household there to be able to stay and live there and make also bishopric seat. So uh, with support of uh, villagers and the nearby people and population living there around, he started building a church and building monastic cells. So that's how the Austro monastery started his, uh, its uh, rising up during the time of St. Basil. So it's said that around 1662 it was established, uh, it was uh, given a uh, ladder of establishment by St. Basil as a hierarch, as a leader of that monastery and the leading uh, ruling bishop of that territory, where it was said that uh, there are two parts of monasteries. So there was the upper part as a monastery itself, and the lower part was just a settlement of um, some people who just uh, seek asylum and they were refugees from the territories under the war and the Turkish uh, unlawfulness and so. So uh, that's how monastery started its uh, rising up, especially uh, in the last decade of St. Basil's life. Here we see it's, in the, as I mentioned, the monastery situated at the borderline between the territories which are now integrated in and nowadays Montenegro. It's important to point out this moment because uh, most of us might not know that uh, Montenegro of nowadays is in fact uh, a conglomerate or mixture of several uh, medieval territories. The, the original Montenegro. This is what I mentioned like um, in the first lecture about St. Peter of Cetini, who listened to that, you might know this. And uh, uh, the original Montenegro, original Cernagora, is only this uh, central part, as you might see now on this uh, right side uh, figure, the map. And the other territories are the other, uh, they have the other and separate history, in fact, like uh, Old Herzegovina is in fact part of Herzegovina, medieval Herzegovina and through the other centuries, like uh, 17th, 18th century, it was still considered as Herzegovina. Only later in 19th century, it was uh, joined to Montenegro state. And the same with the hills. These hills or Brda, which is also a geographical term um, nowadays Montenegro, is uh, the part where people living there recognize themselves also as Serbs, but as also uh, brothers with those from Montenegro. That's why they decided to join in the mid of 19th century after some wars with Turks, and then they joined to original Montenegro and uh, formed the territory called um, Cernagora and Brda, or Montenegro and Hills. 
So this is the same with the Herzegovina and the other parts. They gradually just included uh, were incorporated into the state of Montenegro in modern time. But as I say, uh, uh, Ostrov Monastery is on the borderline between uh, Herzegovina and uh, territory of Brda. It's a territory of uh, Bielopavlici tribe. It's one of many tribes in uh, the medieval Montenegro, so that uh, people there were recognized by uh, belonging to some tribe. It's very similar to the time of um, ancient Israel. As you know, there were 12 tribes so I would like here to point out that even Serbian people at the time, all throughout the centuries and medieval centuries and later, were living uh, in a reflection of uh, the Old and New Testament. Their life were, was more uh, devoted to God and resembling to all what was uh, incorporated in the Holy Scriptures. So people were living, as we say, according to God, according to God's, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, will and uh, everything else. That was the same with the Montenegro people at the time. So uh, they had these brotherhoods or their tribes. Uh, so these Bilopavlici helped St. Basil to protect him from the Turks and also to build this monastery. And later on, several other members of this family supported this monastery even in 18th and 19th century. Some of them became monks and also helped it raising more and more. And uh, eventually St. Basil passed away uh, in, uh, on uh, April 29th, uh, 1671. It's the second half of 17th century. Uh, when there were still many turbulences in the Ottoman Empire, but he uh, passed away peacefully during the prayer. The 29th of April is uh, in a Julian calendar, so it means in a modern or Gregorian calendar, or a new calendar, it's uh, 12 of uh, May, when we celebrate St. Basil's Day. And, uh, it's a, a deep and deep devotion of the people all around the Serbian countries to this cult of St. Basil, to his miracles and uh, his wonder working, as we know. And this cult uh, gradually went over the borderlines of Serbian territory so that many, many other Orthodox people are coming every day, every year, like Russians, Bulgarians, Greeks, and all other people to ask for intercession, for help, and uh, only also to give uh, thanks and glorify God through uh, one of his saints, St. Saint Basil. And there are many, many testimonies about uh, the miracles which uh, were given by, by the intercession of St. Basil. And at this point, it's good to know and good to say here, uh, when we are praying to some saint, we are in fact praying to God to help us to uh, the one of his saint, the, the saint who is uh, regarded as beloved by God, who uh, became a God by God's mercy, who received the deification, as we say this. That, that's the goal and the aim of every Christian life. Even that's a kind of demand for us, for everyone. That's how St. Basil lived. And uh, when we pray to him, in fact, we are praying uh, him to, to help us uh, giving uh, the, the God's divine energies, which are able to come into the world by which the world uh, was created, in fact. So God creates his world, um, the cosmos, or like the, all the uh, cosmic space, every, everything, by uh, the divine energies. So we can participate in divine energies, although we cannot participate in the divine essence. So when we uh, ask for the intercession of the saint, like Saint Basil, we ask uh, for uh, God's divine energies to come to us 
by the intercession of one saint who was living among us in past or in nowadays whenever just the fact that uh, he or she was living among us is the fact that uh, his or her divine body the relics have this power and uh, incorporates these energies which were achieved by many prayers and uh, by the god's mercy uh, in fact that's the other point which i want to point out is that we cannot say what and how makes somebody uh, deified or coming close to god and becoming according to god's will we just know what's the necessary conditions for that we should strive to become better to do more prayers to do more uh, christian life and in, in all the virtues but we can never say that it is enough we never know when and what is enough and we just should uh, be keeping in mind that uh, everything that we are doing is still nothing before god it's still so little it's just adding zero to zero and in that attitude uh, uh, the, the true uh, like the truly christian life can give some uh, fruit and uh, eventually become uh, glorified by god and uh, like that's kind of uh, um, the other aspect which also saint basil kept and preserved in his life like uh, being so humble although being a bishop and metropolitan he lived a truly monastic life he was taking care of many of his parishioners not only of his clergymen of his priests as he was head of the priests let's say as being metropolitan but he also took care of many common peoples people there and he went also to uh, several times to his uh, uh, village where he was born and around there also he supported the building of the church and uh, nowadays uh, that church is reconstructed and built again so there is a uh, uh, his house where he was born now converted into the church so now it's a church in fact and also uh, recently uh, his mother's graveyard has been found and also uh, her relics were found as uh, incorrupted as well so and we can see that it's a matter that uh, one who becomes uh, deified and sanctified uh, sanctifies around himself around himself everybody who is coming to him with a deep faith even uh, during the life during his life and the after his life as it's case with saint basil and um, well now i can just uh, say that there are many many miracles you might know you might have heard or read some of them about some of them this is uh, now i you can see this is uh the the cell in the upper monastery where his relics are situated placed there and you may see uh almost every day there is a priest who gives prayers and people are just uh, climbing up the stairs and coming into the cell one by one uh, saying their needs and then each one is getting a prayer uh, under the uh, vestments of the priest, you know, as it's like in the confession in church, and then uh, the prayer should you know, is read above his or her head, you know, and uh, at, uh, once in uh, several years, or like once in sometimes in a decade or two, uh, the vestments on the holy relics are also replaced. And the previous one also uh, are given to the other churches uh, to be incorporated in the components needed for serving divine liturgy, the antimens, you know, the, the, the piece uh, where uh, the divine service liturgy is served. So each one of these pieces should have, should contain a part of uh, the deified or sanctified either vestments or the relics of saints. And that's the same with Saint Basil. Here I can say one of the miracles from the recent time, like maybe it's the end of uh, 19 or beginning of 20th century, when uh, it, the story goes like this. Uh, um, there was uh, a man 
somewhere around there, also monastery, maybe like Nikšić or that territory in the Crna Gora, Montenegro, who got married and uh, his wife and him, they could not have uh, children. She could not become pregnant for almost eight years. And, uh, you know, for that reason, that's uh, like many uh, pious uh, women, um, brides, and so they go to ask Saint Basil for the intercession, for help uh, to give birth, like to get pregnant, and so. And that was the same here. Uh, so the story says that uh, this, this woman could not uh, become pregnant for eight years. And uh, one night, as you know, it was uh, it were this, like uh, wooden houses, small, poor wooden houses in there, that area. And there were like wooden walls. And uh, at that time, like uh, she was, it was overnight, she heard in the other room, her husband, they're talking with his mother, with her mother-in-law. And at that point, she heard when his, her mother-in-law told her son, like, oh, throw her away. She doesn't give birth. She was like childless. So throw her away and bring the other woman. But uh, at that moment, it was said that uh, her heart, heart was beating so fast and she was just about to leave the house, to go away, never get back. But at the last moment she heard her husband saying, but mother, I cannot do that. I really love her. Then she changed her mind and decided the next day to go to visit the relics of St. Basil. And she went there and prayed and wanted to pray just before she started praying, just uh, the moment when she stood there before the relics, she felt like the warmness and uh, something warm around her. And she just uh, was so upset and, uh, you know, in the deep devotion and prayer that she was nearly to lose consciousness. And she was almost in a dream at that moment. And she heard saints saying to her, why do you worry about giving birth and pregnancy? You will have so many kids that you won't be able to keep them on your hands. Afterwards, when she completed her prayer and went out from cell and get back, she became pregnant soon afterwards. And in the next 20 years, she gave birth uh, success successfully like uh, for 17 times. And three of these times she gave birth to twins. So in total, she gave birth to 20 kids. Which is really amazing. Not, uh, not that it's amazing that someone gave birth after many years of like not being able to get pregnant, but even more that she gave birth to so many kids. It's really, really rare. It's like almost unheard and so, you know. And many, many other uh, miracles which you can hear from one another from the testimonies of the pious people in and around Montenegro also like uh, recently there were some Russian testimonies because many Russian people were coming there starting in like 2000 2005 and uh, there were also some testimonies that uh, some people who were paralyzed or having some uh, physical uh, uh, damage or hurt or whatever were uh, healed and uh, some paralyzed started walking and something there are also many medical testimonies in support of this like of those who were patients in some medical clinics or whatever where after their visit to saint basil for one or more times and when they went there after that when they went to their medical doctors and were examined there were fully testimonies of the doctors that something has changed that they, nobody can explain that medicine cannot explain so we see there are really really many of the miracles of saint basil and uh, well i would not 
it is per disturbing in many of <laughs> this. Uh, just uh, if you have any other comment or question, or uh, I'm also, I would like to hear any of your witnesses or testimonies, if you also have one of those. I would just recommend you now at the end uh, some movies, like this one is very good and it gives uh, also the stories of some people who, was, who were visiting St. Basil for many years. It's uh, a movie originally in Serbian, that there is also a translation, it's such a fate I have not found even in Israel, which are words of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, written in the Gospel of Matthew. And you have the link here. And also there is one friend of mine who lives in Atlanta, Georgia, a girl who has spent many days there in the uh, Ostrog Monastery next to the relics of St. Basil. Just almost every summer she goes there and spends some time because she has some relatives there and she liked to be there, you know. And she also gave me, gave me a permission to give her contact here if anybody wants to hear more about all the miracles that she uh, has seen there and just had an occasion to do that, to be there at that time. So thank you everybody and please let me know if you have any questions. I just forgot to turn the light on. Yeah, uh, this is Ron uh, uh, Miroslav. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I had a quest, couple questions. One, um, uh, first of all, is, is the uh, monastery there in some danger because of this new Montenegrin government uh, uh, policies against the church? Yes, thank you, Ron, for this question. Yeah, that's uh, one of the ongoing questions and problems right now. All the church properties in Montenegro are now endangered by the new proclaimed law. Uh, in fact, against uh, the church properties, which should be confiscated by the state, like nationalized. It's very similar to the act that uh, communists did, like in the late 40s, after they came into power in the former Yugoslavia. So, that's why some people, some historians and politicians call this regime in Montenegro that it's uh, the last communist uh, ruler in the ex-Yugoslavia or even in the Europe, which still survived after many years, like, because he was uh, the head of Montenegro state in the late 80s, then throughout the 90s and in 2000s as well. And uh, it's uh, gradually worsening the situation in Montenegro through these years. At the other side, opposite to that, it's also the increasing uh, uh, the church life there. So there are becoming more and more church, more and more devoted, faithful people who are ready to support and protect their church. And most of these people in Montenegro recognize themselves as a part of Serbian church. So not like uh, of those like uh, schismatics or like minority of those which belong to the other. But uh, like they recognize and they have deep feeling. Some of them recognize themselves as Serbs. Some of them recognize themselves as Montenegrins. As you know, it's the other let's say more uh, political question about the identity of the people there, which could be also discussed. And although there, are, there might be many of you here who have some uh, uh, ancestry of Montenegro there, I must be honest uh, and just say to the truth, the, to the historian truth that there is uh, no basements for uh, claiming of the Montenegro identity. It's just like, uh, for me, myself, like I was born in Bosnia, in the Bosnska Krajina, I could say I'm Krajnik. But uh, it is just a regional uh, determination, but not uh, like the nation. And that's the same in Montenegro, because as you might see in there in the presentation, there are many different territories which were incorporated in the nowadays Montenegro, which do not have even the same history. They do not belong to the same a state in the past in medieval time and throughout the Ottoman rulership and later they were not immediately included in Montenegro but gradually 
through the centuries. So that's what is not uh, uh, considered and not uh, recognized by this government now, and they now try to, to make uh, artificial uh, identity of Montenegrins and, and of Montenegrin languages, which is uh, even worse to say that there is another language with the same structure, the same linguistics, and everything the same as a Serbian language, and to be said, to be named in the other, like as the other language, and so on. It's the same with church, they now try to confiscate this these properties and subsequently either to give it to these schismatics or to the worst to get the, you know, the profit from these church properties in fact to keep it as for the mortgages or for any anything else for just some kind of uh, private affairs which is unacceptable but fortunately, people are very strong, and I think they won't uh, just, uh, they will reject and refuse this, and there will be no way to get it to the end as they want, you know. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I had a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that he lived for several years at Tverdosh Monastery. Yes, and he was ge getting back and forth from Tverdos to Ostrog and uh, back to, to, to Ostrog, and, you know, it was uh, due to the Ottoman rulership at that time and many wars and insecurity, many military affairs there. So that's why he was sometimes forced to move from one place to the other. So okay. he had two places. You can imagine now like uh, when one bishop has two places for residing and that's like no. what he had at the time. Well, I, I was always interested in Tverdosh because I can walk there from my father's house. Oh, wow, yeah, great, uh, yes. It's about two kilometers and uh, very easy to... So when well, you mentioned... Tverdosh is uh, another story for itself. You know, Tverdosh uh, was established for the first time in fourth century, very, very long time ago, even before the Serbian states were established there. And throughout the centuries, it was destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt again and again and so on. And then in the late medieval time, it was a seat of uh, diocese of Zakum and Herzegovin. That's what is known. And in the time of Saint Basil, it's 17th century. It's a very interesting time, you know. It's a, um, about the mid of the Turkish uh, rulership over the Serbian people and Serbian land. It was a very, very difficult time. You cannot even imagine just by through this uh, lecture, I didn't point out so much, but now I can say more that. Um, you know, it's like we can make a comparison between these centuries, like Serbian territories fell under the Turkish rulership in the end of 15th century. And then in 16th century, Turks uh, had the expansion of their territories. They had the expansion of their economy. And uh, as a consequence, they didn't disturb their subordinate people, like the Christian people but they gave them some freedom for the commerce, for some other activities, for handling and do, doing some work, but just to pay them some tribute, annual tributes and so on, you know. And uh, they saw even more that they can keep them even faster under their rulership if they uh, give them some kind of uh, religious freedom and if they gave them uh, the established independent church. So they saw that it's good for Serbian people to get independent church, the church independent from the uh, Constantinople, from Istanbul at the time, you know, and from uh, the Constant patriarch of the Constantinople. They saw that as long as uh, the head of church is under the Turks, meaning that uh, he lives <laughs> in the same state of the Ottoman Empire, uh, the people can be controlled. That's why Ottoman uh, Turks opposed Roman Catholics, for instance, and all the other faiths which had their heads out of the Ottoman Empire. So they prosecuted them more, even more than Serbian people in 16th century. And Serbs enjoyed some kind of freedom, you know, it was good for them. But 
as you might just guess here, that the Syrian people wanted, of course, their independence and their freedom. And at the end of 16th century, and the onward uh, of some Austrian Turkish wars, at the end of like, um, it was uh, 1594, something like that. Um, Serbs also uh, rose up, there was an uprisal in the northern parts of the Ottoman territories. It's nowadays uh, Vojvodina and uh, Slavonia and uh, Hungary. But uh, as you know, Turks at the time were very strong. Eventually they won in that war and there was uh, uh, retribution and the punishment of all those Serbian uh, appraisers. Among them, it was also a patriarch of the Serbian church, uh, Patriarch John, John Kantul, who was murdered uh, in the beginning of 17th century at the end of this appraisal period. And uh, from there on, Turks started uh, withdrawing slightly, losing their power all over the 17th century, they still kept the territories all up to the nowadays um, Slovakia. But they started like losing the power and the other states around the Turkish Empire were rising up more and more. So it was disbalanced. And uh, once the Ottoman Empire stopped their uh, conquering the territories, their economy stopped because their economy was based only on the conquering. And from that time on, they started uh, increasing the tributes from the uh, people, from their subordinates, and that even made uh, things worse and worse and caused uh, even more and more appraisals. And that was this turbulent 17th century. At the end of 16th century, you also might know that uh, the relics of Saint Sava were burnt on Vračar in Belgrade, nowadays Belgrade. Uh, Turks wanted to uh, pace down the people and just to make them fearful from the Turkish uh, rulers and they did it. So at that moment, at these years, people were really frightened from the fact that they lost uh, the relics of their saint among saints, the greatest one, Saint Sava. But uh, as we see here, God is giving the consolence to people by uh, rising up another saint of 17th century, Saint Basil, which uh, was given as a kind of supporter to people and as a light, which lights uh, in a shadow, in a darkness for these people there uh, during this hard time. And later on, as we see now, uh, it's, uh, let's say, coming one by one. God is always uh, forward thinking about how to protect us uh, through the centuries. And then uh, in the 18th century, we have St. Peter of Cetin. And then in 19th century, we have more of them. And also in 20s as well. So every period, every time, there is a way for every one of us to become saints. So please, Ron, yeah, I interrupted you. No, that's fine. That, that's good. That, that that's was one good. question, yeah. <laughs> but you that, said that, you had that, several more. That, yeah, no, I think you answered actually both of them in, your, in that context. So thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Oh. What, what made them carve it in the mountain? Oh yeah, how, how did they, how did they, well the, you said the mountain was, they put it in the mountain because of the caves, right? So that's why they built the monastery there. Oh yes, yes. he was there even before he became a bishop. Uh, he went there as a monk. He started to see wh whether there would be possible to stay for prayers. During the turbulent periods when he had, when he was forced to move from Ferdosh, he moved there and started making these caves uh just possible for uh, life for staying there and that's how it was the first initial uh the core uh the origin of the future monastery but yeah. uh, in 1662 later on it was uh proclaimed as a monastery it was established and recognized legally as uh, a territory of the monastery which then uh, was subdued to the 
tribute to pay to the Turks. You know, every house uh, of the Christian people and every church, every monastery itself needed to pay separately, uh, you know, uh, amount of money for, or not only money, it's just a kind of like, or some food or giving something uh, as a you know, tribute, annual tribute. Basically tax. Oh, Drago, hey. <laughs> uh yeah anybody else uh, any question please yeah tax is better word tax is better word sorry yeah yeah that's good <laughs> good point <laughs> um i have a question it's sanella okay uh, yeah so is there a reason why there's an upper monastery and a lower monastery oh yes of course that's what i tried to mention maybe un unsuccessfully uh oh, sorry. Upper monastery was a place where he spent his uh, monastic life and where originally monastery, monastery was established. But the lower monastery was more like metok. It was uh, more uh, as a settlement for the people who wanted to support monastery and who was like workers, let's say workers settlement, workers with their families. Some mm -hmm. of them later became also monks once they become like widowed or whatever. But anyway, it was started as a settlement and later on, it was also converted into monastery gradually. And also, okay. later on, it was first converted into the place for younger monks. Like, for instance, like in 18th century, they recognized, okay, it's not for everybody to stay in the caves. You can imagine in 18th century, it was not still looking like this today. It was not so built with these uh, uh, concrete parts and strong. It was still just like a cave, a little bit modified. It was very cold over the winter time. And they said, okay, this is just for uh, long time monks who are deep in the spiritual life and who can sustain this and stay there for long, like decades and so on. But for younger monks or for like novices, it was a lower monastery. Okay. And can visitors go to both upper and lower? Excuse me? Have you been? Have you been? Yeah, there? yeah, yeah. It's just a part, it's one complex. Once you, you enter, you arrive from highway you enter this the lower monastery then you cannot drive to the upper monastery you can just walk it's about i don't know maybe two miles or something like that oh okay. and it's also a tradition among the people from montenegro and from some other parts of serbian lands it's like somebody are walking on their bare foot you know bare feet uh so they don't wear any uh, shoes, boots, anything like that. It's just bare feet and they walk up to the monastery. It's kind of like giving wow. some kind of sacrifice for what God, you know. Huh? <coughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> you, yeah, you should go, you should visit. You do, I have a, Yes, Anella, anytime uh, you, you can, you, you should go there and just, it, it's an um, undescribable experience. You, you have a uh, you have a special feeling when you're there. I, I I was only there once about three years ago, but you you get there and you feel very special. Yeah. It's something different, you know. It's yeah. not. Uh, it's it's really amazing, you know. Yeah. Yeah, we went into recommendation from Ron. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>